Hello everyone, this is Professor Major Anagila, and in this video lecture, we're going to discuss the different types of isomerism exhibited by the transition metal complexes. So isomerism is when there are several compounds which have the same formula, but they differ in how the atoms are arranged in space. So we call these compounds as isomers of one another. There are two general types, and these are prostitutional isomerism and stereoisomerism. In constitutional isomerism, the atoms are connected differently, whereas in stereoisomerism, there is the same connection, but they differ in how the atoms are arranged in space. So under constitutional isomerism, or sometimes referred to as structural isomerism, we have different types. First one would be the linkage isomer. Second would be the ionization isomer. And then the last one would be the coordination isomer. So linkage isomer is brought upon by having different metal legal bonds, whereas uh, ionization isomers, those that give rise to different ions when dissolved in a solution. Coordination isomer, on the other hand, are those wherein the ligands are distributed differently. Focusing on linkage isomerism, Linkage isomer is when one of the ligands that is bonded to the metal is an ambidentate ligand. An ambidentate ligand, to differentiate it from the bidentate ligand, is the one that has more than one possible way of coordination. So bidentate is having two donor atoms. Ambidentate is having two donor atoms, but those donor atoms cannot be used to simultaneously combine to the metal. An example of which is the nitrite ion or the thiocyanate ion or the cyanide ion. You can see in the following illustrations, the underlined element signifies that it is the donor atom. So for nitrite, it can bind to the metal through nitrogen or through one of the oxygen. For thiocyanate, it can bind through the sulfur or the nitrogen. And for cyanide, it can combine through carbon or nitrogen. So an example would be illustrated in here. So for one arrangement wherein the nitrite ion is bonded to the metal. This is referred to as the nitro complex, whereas one arrangement wherein one of the oxygen is connected to the metal. This is traditionally referred to as the nitrito complex. So an example of a nitro and a nitrito complexes would be the following. So we have a cobalt complex here. This is uh, an octahedral complex with five ammonia molecules bonded to it, but the nitrite ion is arranged differently. For the nitro complex, it is bonded through nitrogen. For the nitrito complex, it is bonded through oxygen. Now for stereoisomers, these are the ones which has the same connections for the atoms, but if you're going to take a look into this in space, so a 3D arrangement, there's a different spatial arrangement for the atoms. So there are two types, diastereomers and enantiomers. So diastereomers or geometric isomers, these are isomers that are not considered to be mirror images of one another. 
whereas enantiomers or optical isomers are those isomers that are mirror images of one another. So geometric isomer or diastereomer, since these isomers have different physical chemical properties, such as color, melting point, solubility, polarity, chemical reactivities, these stereoisomers can be differentiated out from one another by considering those physical chemical properties. But these stereoisomers cannot be interconverted from one isomer or one diastereomer to the other without breaking a chemical bond. An example of which would be the cis-trans isomerism, which is exhibited by square planar complexes. So in this illustration at the left, so we have platinum there with two chloride ligand and two ammonia ligand. In this arrangement, the two chlorides are side by side or adjacent to one another, as well as the two ammonia ligands. So this arrangement is referred to as the cis arrangement. In contrast, as shown on the structure at the right, so if you have the chlorides opposite one another, or taking a look into the two ammonia molecules, they are opposite one another, this is referred to as the trans arrangement. Cis-trans isomerism is also observed for octahedral complexes, as with our example over here. So take a look into the position of the two chloride ions that are bonded to cobalt. They are adjacent to one another or side by side. So we can say that this arrangement is cis. Whereas if you take a look into this arrangement wherein the two chlorides are opposite one another, or they are at 180 degree apart. So this is considered to be the trans arrangement. And isolated samples of this complexes, they are very much different in terms of the colors. Another type of geometric isomerism exhibited by octahedral complexes is the FAP and MER isomer. Considering these two structures shown, if you're taking a look into how the chlorides are arranged with respect to one another, or you can also focus your attention on how the ammonia are arranged with respect to one another, you will notice that on the structure at the left, the chlorides are arranged in such a way that if you take a look into it, they make up a triangle. In fact, that triangle is one of the faces of an octahedron. Whereas on the structure on the right, if you try to take a look into how the chlorides are arranged, if you connect those three chloride ligands, they somewhat make up an arc, a meridian arrangement. So for this case, the structure on the left is the fact or the facial isomer and the structure on the right is the mer for meridional isomer. So the last type of isomerism would be the optical isomerism or enantiomers. For these isomers, most of the properties, physical chemical properties of the isomers are actually the same. We're talking about color, melting point, solubility, polarity, chemical reactivities. So this type of isomers cannot be simply separated and distinguished from one another based on this typical physical chemical characterization. They differ though in the rate of reactivity with what is known as the chiral agents, as well as their interaction with a plane polarized light. So if you're going to take a look into their structure, they are considered to be non-superimposable mirror images of one another. So if you have the two mirror images, you cannot fit one mirror image on top of one another. They 
it will not fit 100% on all points. So optical isomers are also referred to as chiral molecules, which are considered to be optically active. And one of the characteristics would be these molecules are able to rotate the plane of polarized light. So in this illustration, this is how optical activity is measured for chiral molecules. So you have an optically active substance in solution. So you put that in a polarimeter tube and you place that in a polarimeter. So at both ends of the polarimeter tube, there is actually a polarizer. So the function of the polarizer is to select a plane of polarized light. So from the light source, you have the polarizer. So it will select the plane of polarized light. Now, that plane of polarized light, when it interacts with the optically active solution in the polarimeter tube, it slightly changes its direction. So in the illustration, if this goes up and down, once it interacts with an optically active substance, you can see in here that it changes to the opposite. So in this direction. And what you're actually doing, what you are measuring in this uh, polarimetry is that you're uh, going to adjust the second polarizer at the end in such a way that it will result to the original direction of the plane of polarized light. And that adjustment that you're going to do, there's a certain angle that you need to move it, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and that's the one that you're going to measure to describe optically active chiral molecules. But for our purposes today, we're going to analyze a certain structure and figure out if it is optically active. And as I've said, optical isomers are enantiomers, which are non-superimposable mirror images of one another. And a classic example of that would be our hands. So our hands are actually mirror images of one another, but there's no point that you can overlap and get it to match up at all points, left hand over the right hand. So in this example, we have this complex, which is made up of cobalt as a central atom and chloride ions, two of those, and ethylene diamine. Recall that ethylene diamine has this formula. And when it forms, and when it coordinates to the metal, it coordinates through this two nitrogen to so making up a chelate ring. In the reference that I've got, so they represented the ethylene diamine structure as just simply this ring form. But I strongly discourage you to do that. What I want you to do is to draw out the actual structure of ethylene diamine. So you can draw it like this. So NH2, NH2, CH2, CH2, then connect that to the nitrogen. You can also do that over here, NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2, and then connect that. Together. So I want you to draw out the structure rather than illustrating it as this uh, ring form. But proceeding on with this uh, illustration, we have the cis isomer. So you can see that two chloride ions are side by side or adjacent. In fact, if you're going to consider the positioning of ethylene diamine, they are also side by side or adjacent with one another. So these two isomers are mirror images of one another. 
although they might overlap on the positions of the chloride, the distinct arrangement brought upon by the chelate ring, it makes it quite impossible for the two chelate rings to totally overlap with the two chelate rings of the structure on the left. That's why this isomer, the cis isomer, is optically active. So these are the two enantiomers of the cis isomer. So we say that the cis isomer is chiral. But when you consider the trans isomer, so the two chloride ligands are opposite one another, as well as if you're going to take a look into the positions of the ethylene diamine structure, it is also opposite one another. So those two are opposite one another. And the two mirror images are actually superimposable with one another. If you try to overlap that with the structure on the left, those two are actually going to be overlapping perfectly with one another. So the trans isomer is not an optical isomer, so it is not chiral or a chiral. Another type of optical isomerism for octahedral complexes would be if we have three chelating ligands, such as ethylene diamine. This is again very much discouraged. You cannot uh, write the abbreviation or the shorthand in illustrating the structure. It is better to draw out the actual structure of the ligand. So instead of EN, I strongly encourage you to draw out the structure, which is NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2 for ethylene diamine. But if we have this structure wherein we have three chelating ligands, so three bidentate ligands making up the chelate ring, if you have the mirror image of that, you will notice that they are not superimposable with one another. So to guide you, uh, you can check the propeller of an electric fan. So you will notice that the propeller of the electric fan can go, if you try to follow the direction of each of the blade, can go clockwise. If you draw the mirror image of that, that means the direction of the blade will go counterclockwise. And those two, if you try to on top of one another, so they are so tetrahedral complexes can be optically active if we have four different groups around the central metal. So if those two, so if those four ligands around the central metal are complete, we can consider the complex as Or if we have two chelating ligands, in this case, the two chelating ligands are actually of the same type. So in the formula, it is referenced as AB. But because of the chelate ring that is formed, it somewhat restricts the possibility of having superimposability of the two mirror images. So this is also an example of optical isomerism for tetrahedral complexes.